Assalamu alaikum. Today we will begin with lecture 9 and I will look at the last two po parts of the poem The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, Mariner with you. Let's just briefly recap what we did in the last few lectures because today we are going to conclude this poem. Uh, in the previous three lectures uh, I analyzed the poem with you in detail. Uh, we went line uh, uh, for line and uh, we looked at the various themes that emerged from the poem. Uh, the themes I will discuss uh, towards the end with you also in detail, uh, but uh, some of the themes that we were carrying f uh, forward from the second part onwards, like uh, there was a theme of sin and redemption, there was a theme of imprisonment, there was a theme of revenge of the natural and the supernatural world, then there is a theme of guilt. Uh, you have to keep these uh, themes in mind because as we now approach the concluding uh, uh, session, we will see how uh, uh, how these, these are resolved, how Coleridge attempts uh, to bring them to their uh, conclusion. So uh, the part that we are going to do today, parts in fact that we, that we are going to do today, uh, 6 and 7 are uh, not that, uh, not extremely important from the point of view of uh, you know the the themes that have were developed in the previous parts because uh, uh, part six initially only revolves around his journey backwards his journey back home and how he's absolved of his sins and how his punishment uh, is now will now be over but only part of the punishment as we shall see in fact as I explained to you uh, towards uh, the end of the previous lecture uh, the last few lines of part 5 uh, describe that uh, he's uh, the two voices speaking to each other and one of them uh, says that penance he's done and penance more he shall do so a part of the punishment is over but part of it is uh, will be carried on he will pay for the rest of his life for the sin that he committed against humanity the sin that he con committed against uh, nature, the sin that he commits, committed against uh, the natural world, the supernatural world, against God, because uh, against God, because all creatures are gods, mm, are part of God. Parts, uh, the last part, which is part 7, that uh, will assume significance once again, because it will be in that part where Coleridge will spell out his moral lesson to you. So since we have plenty to do today, because I intend to finish both the parts in the same lecture, I'm going to uh, rush through it and uh, not take any of your time. So let's start with part 6. Uh, you have to remember that in the previous uh, part, that was in part 5, uh, the ancient mariner uh, had uh, fallen down and had uh, become incon unconscious and it was in that state of mind that he heard two voices talking to each other and he realized that the two voices were talking about him and one of the voices was kind and, and gentler uh, more gentle than the other one so it is the, uh, the, that, that talk still continues in the sixth part so part six. First voice but tell me, tell me, speak again, thy soft response renewing. What makes that ship drive on so fast? What is the ocean doing? Now those voices, they're, they're talking to each other about the state of the ship, about its movement. Because if you remember, what had happened was that all those, uh, all the bodies, all the, uh, all the souls, that uh, uh, that had possessed the bodies of his uh, uh, dead companions they were singing he heard them the ancient mariner heard them singing all through the night at dawn time and even after they stopped singing the sail seemed to go on uh, singing and carrying forward the song that they were singing so it and towards the end of the song uh, eventually the ship reaches the line again which is the equator and as equator, as I've ex explained so many times, this is where uh, the changes in the plot occur. The ship initially stops, like it did in all previous parts, but uh, this time it doesn't stop for a long time, but it moves forward again, 
and with a, a, a you know a slightly um, zigzag motion and not in a stable form it stops and then jerks forward and as a result of this jerky motion of the ship the ancient mariner uh, falls down and uh, is uh, goes unconscious and then dreams of these two voices and the ship still is moving at a fast pace so these voices now are discussing the movement of the ship so the first one asks the, uh, the other one the second voice what makes a ship drive on so fast why is the ship driving so fast is it the ocean is it the ocean that is making her driving fast the second voice replies it says still as a slave before his lord the ocean had no blast his great bright eye most silently up to the moon is cast the ocean is personified here because he uses the word his his great bright eye he says the ocean has nothing to do with it the ocean is not uh, making the ship move forward it is it's the soul of the world it is a lord it is a spirit of the world it is a natural and the supernatural world combined which are making the ship move forward it's not the wind it's not the ocean it's not the waves in the ocean it's not the sails mm, it's it's just the natural and the supernatural world that want the ancient mariner to be saved if he may know which way to go for she guides him smooth or grim see brother see how graciously she she looketh down on him now in the previous stanza he talked about the moon so now he's saying that it is the moon so the object of nature that is now guiding him it is guiding the ship and it is guiding him it is guiding the ship onwards in a smooth fashion and you see it says again see brother see how graciously she looketh down on him so even graciously she looketh down on him the nature is now kind towards the ancient mariner it is now protective towards the ancient mariner it now supports the ancient mariner initially uh, it was working against the ancient mariner but now you say it has become the ancient mariner's friend because he is now partly redeemed the first voice says again but why drives on that ship so fast without or wave or wind the first voice is again still confused he asks but still how does the ship move on move forward at such a great pace without any wave or without any wind the second voice patiently replies the air is cut away before and closes from behind fly brother fly more high more high or we shall be belated for slow and slow that ship will go when the mariner's trance is abated so he uh, says two things in this reply the second voice he explains to the first voice that everything in nature is helping the ship to move forward the air opens up its passage in front of the ship and closes its passage at uh, from behind so that the only way is the way forward there is no way backward so but then he asks his uh, companion to fly higher and quickly because he says uh, with the pace of the ship because he says once the mariner's trance once the mariner recovers his consciousness is abated is over he's the ship will then move in a slow fashion and it is then that the mariner wakes up he says i woke and we were sailing on as in a gentler gentle weather so he says when i woke up exactly this was it was what the voices were saying the ship was now moving gently it was night calm night the moon was high the dead men stood together so so although he was listening to these voices in this soon in his unconscious state of mind but uh, he realizes that what he was hearing was actually real it was truth so you see how coleridge blends the supernatural and the uh, supernatural and the natural world together uh, this hearing of voices of strange voices of uh, maybe spirits or ghosts or angels uh, he hears them he hears them in a state of sometimes in, in in this case in the state of unconsciousness but all of it is also real because when he wakes up the so moon is shining it is night time as the voices were talking that the moon guides the ship on and they said that when he will wake up 
the ship will go at a gentler pace, it will slow down and this is what he finds and everything is calm and at its uh, right proper uh, place. And another strange thing is that the dead men stood together. So the bodies of his uh, dead uh, sailors, they all were standing together. All stood together on the deck for a charnel dungeon fitter. All fixed on me their stony eyes that in the moon did glitter. The eyes, they are dead people but their eyes are still glittering. You see, their eyes are shining in the moonlight and all these dead bodies, this must be a strange sight for the mariner. He wakes up to find all his dead companions standing together on the deck waiting for him as if to get up and uh, as if they have something to say to him. So they are standing there on the deck, all these dead bodies and have, they have fixed him with their eyes. The pang, the curse with which they died had never passed away. I could not dry my, draw my eyes from theirs nor turn them up to pray. He says, but the guilt, his guilt is not over. That's not gone. The mariner still feels guilty for causing death to them. So he says, their, their hurt, their pang, their curse, it had not gone away from their looks. So even now the mariner feels that in their, in their, in their looks, in their glare, there was a curse. There was, they were blaming him for uh, their deaths. He says, I could not draw my eyes from theirs. He couldn't look away and he could not even pray. And now the spell was snapped. Once more I viewed the ocean green. But then he says, I, uh, this spell was over and I looked towards the ocean and the ocean was green. You see, it is green and beautiful and looked far forth, yet still little saw of what had else been seen. He says, even when I looked far, uh, at a far distance, he couldn't, he couldn't see much. Like one that on a lonesome road doth wa walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him dread. Coleridge here describes the state of a mind of a person who's, who's all alone, and is traveling through a deserted path and is f uh, really frightened and it happens to any one of us when we sometimes wake up in the middle of the night after a scary dream we sometimes out of fear of what we have seen we can't even turn our head and we can't even we don't we don't even move our eyes sideways out of fear of being uh, found out so uh, it is this fear that he's talking about he says as if someone on a lonesome road is walking all by himself in f uh, and is full of fear and dread and he turns just one once and then never turns again because he's so frightened that as if there is a fiend who's following him but soon there breathed a wind on me nor sound or motion made but he says soon he felt some kind of wind blowing against him but he with uh, this was a wind again a strange supernatural kind of a wind or phenomena he says because he says there was neither the sound nor the motion but he felt a breath of wind so but without any motion no movement and no sound its path was not upon the sea in ripple or in shade and he says this wind did not blow on the waves on the sea it raised my hair, it fanned my cheek like a meadow gale of spring. It mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. He says, I only felt the wind, but uh, it, uh, it didn't move anything else. It, he says, it raised my hair, it fanned my cheek, it was like a fresh wind of spring. And he, it took away all his fears took away all the fears, the fear that he had felt upon seeing all those dead bodies standing there on the deck as if accusing him of something, as if wanting something from him. Maybe the mariner at this point dreaded that they want to harm him, that they want to take his life also. 
so he is afraid of them so he is he says i stood there motionless i couldn't look towards the ocean i couldn't look up to pray because he knew that he uh, was sinful he knew that he was their criminal so he was their sinner so he uh, he stood there motionless as if afraid then he gives you a simile as if afraid uh, like a person who who's all alone and who cannot turn his head sideways out of fear of being um, uh, attacked by the fiend and it is at this point that he says i feel a breath of fresh fresh wind fresh air which takes away all his fears swiftly swiftly flew the ship yet she sailed softly too sweetly sweetly blew the breeze on me alone it blew so you see the blessings the blessings of nature nature now even takes away his fears in the previous parts we saw how nature and the supernatural world it induced fear in him but in this part we see how it is even allaying his fears it is taking away it is removing his fears and uh, he says the ship moved on softly and the wind blew on me alone softly so taking away all his fears making him comfortable and at ease and at peace with himself oh dream of joy is this indeed the lighthouse top i see is this a hill is this the kirk is this my own country so he's look at his joy he's full of joy now because he say he sees the same things that he saw once a long time back when he before he embarked on this journey the lighthouse the hill the kirk which is a church he says and his own country we drifted over the harbor bar and i with sobs did pray look at his emotions he's so full of emotions at having finally reached his country safely that he is crying he says i with sobs did pray and he's praying as he's crying oh let me be awake my god or let me sleep always he says so his prayer is if i am if it's a dream if it's a dream that in my dream i'm seeing my country i'm seeing my land i'm seeing my safety he says make me awake let me be awake oh god and then he says or otherwise he says if it's uh, if it's what i'm seeing is not real then let me sleep away because th this dream is much more pleasant the harbor bay was clear as glass so smoothly it was strewn and on the bay the moonlight lay and the shadow of the moon so he can see the harbor and the bay at the distance the harbor is a place where the ships uh, uh, rest and uh, they stay after they come and stay after the long uh, journey and bay is uh, the peaceful enclosure of water uh, f uh, 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 out of the ocean so he um, he says that everything was clear uh, neat and peaceful and calm at the bay on the bay the moonlight lay and the shadow of the moon the rock shone bright the kirk no less that stands above the rock so he says under the moonlight the rock meaning the hill is shining and the church on the top of the hill is shining. see the symbol the religious symbol that coleridge is using here the thing that becomes the center of focal focus of his attention of uh, the ancient mariner is the church and the rock Uh, it may bring to your mind uh, the the Al-Aqsa mosque in Jerusalem because it is also built uh, on a rock so which is uh, which is a symbol of holiness uh, for all all three religions Islam uh, uh, Judaism and Christianity so he says the rock was shining bright and the church also was bright shining bright the moonlight steeped in silentness the steady weather cock so he says but everything was peaceful everything was calm and silent and the bay was wide with silent light see continuously he's talking about silence and peace white and the uh, the shining uh, brightness of the moon till rising from the same full many shapes that shadows were in crimson colors came and then he, in the silent night he saw many shapes coming in different colors 
a little distance from the pro those crimson shadows were he says then he he understood what those shadows were he says I turned my eyes upon the deck oh Christ what saw I there so his attention now is caught from the bay or the, the beautiful scene of the harbor to back to his ship because he senses some shadows moving on the ship each course lay flat lifeless and flat and by the holy root a man or light a seed of man and every on every course there stood course is a corpse C O R P S E corpse which means the dead body so you see near each dead body lay which lay flat and lifeless he says there stood a spirit you can call an angel because he calls him an angel a seed of man is an angel he says a man of light stood next to the each dead body so we, we can say it was the spirit that had taken hold that taken possession of those dead bodies or uh, which uh, he, uh, the ancient mariner is trying to imply were not the actual souls of these dead sailors but these were the angels which had been sent to take possession of these dead bodies by God because uh, nature and God now wanted to help the ancient mariner so the angels had come to his aid they had come for uh, to his help and now these uh, angels or these uh, pure spirits they had now left the body and they were standing next to the dead body this seed of band each waved his hand it was a heavenly sight they stood as signals to the land each one a lovely light what they are doing now as the ship is now close to the harbor they now say goodbye to the ancient mariner they are poles of light they are posts of light these spirits these are spirits of light they have no body they have no uh, physical structure they are only light so he says they each wave their hand and it was a heavenly sight but then he says this light also that was part of their soul spirits it, it gave a signal to the land so sometimes when a, uh, a sailor when, an, when a ship is approaching the bay it gives signals to the um, send signal to the land and if it needs uh, some kind of help so this light shining from these uh, spirits from these angels it sends signals to the land because soon some help will come from the land the seer of Pan each waved his hand no voice did they impart so they don't communicate they don't although Coleridge blends both the worlds beautifully but he's but uh, and he shows both the worlds as one but uh, they commun the, both the worlds also communicate with each other they help each other uh, they also uh, take revenge from the other but they don't uh, you know they, there's no talking between them no voice but oh the silence sank like music on my heart but this silence is not oppressive this silence is not like lead on his heart he says it is like music on my heart so he he liked the sight but soon I heard the dash of oars you see the immediate result of the signal that these spirits had sent to the land and now you might be wondering why they sent the signal to the land because the ancient mariner was already on a ship and the ship was moving towards uh, the harbor and it could easily have uh, reached there parked there and there was no problem but no only the ancient mariner from this journey was meant to survive the ship and all the other crew members and their bodies they were not meant to reach the land it was only it was the only fate of the ancient mariner so this this was the reason that they waited till the last time when they were visible um, and they could be seen uh, by a naked eye uh, from the land that these spirits they took leave and as they took leave the light that shone through them uh, it was seen by some people on land as some kind of a signal uh, which normally sailors give when they ship or when they are in need of help 
So, but soon I heard, so immediate result of the signal is that a boat is approaching their ship. I heard the pilots cheer. A pilot is uh, cheer, uh, r r driving the boat. My head was turned per force away and I saw a boat appear. The pilot and the pilot's boy. The two people on the boat are, one is a pilot and then is the other. The other is his young boy. I heard them coming fast because they thought that there was someone who needed help. So they were coming fast. They were rowing fast. Dear Lord in heaven, it was a joy the dead man could not blast. He was so happy. He was so overcome with joy when he saw, when he saw what? He, when he saw life, sign of life, when he saw humans after such a long, long time, it could, it could, uh, uh, ha, it could not have been less than you know any uh, uh, any kind of uh, immense joy that we feel at any moment in our life. So it was a joy, he says, that I had not felt on any occasion. It was something that even uh, m uh, my conscience, which was heavy uh, with the burden of causing death to my partners, he says, even that uh, weight, it could not diminish the joy. I saw a third, but then he says there was a third person on the boat. I heard his voice, it is the hermit good. First, Goldrich talks about the church, church upon the bright rock, the bright church on the bright rock, the symbol of the religion. Now he talks about the hermit, and a hermit is, we discussed the hermit in the Tintin Abbey also, he's a person who's, who's a recluse, who's a recluse who lives away from society, who spends his time uh, in nature, surrounded by nature, and spends his time in prayer most of the time. So he is a good fellow, he's a pure soul and he's always in the service of his Lord. So his hermit is on the boat. He singeth loud his godly hymns, and as he's approaching the ship, he's singing hymns. Maybe this is also a custom, when they saw that the, sh uh, the people on the land noticed that there was someone who needed their help, they also brought the hermit along, because in, Christ uh, in the Christian religion, when someone's dying, uh, a, a priest, has to come and has to uh, redeem the soul, has to uh, 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 seek pardon, forgiveness for the soul of the dying person. So it is the last rituals that a priest has to do for a dying person. So maybe that is why the hermit was also brought along or maybe he was available. But better guess is that because they thought that uh, the hermit's prayer might be needed. He'll shrieve my soul, he'll wash away the albatross's bed. See the immediate reaction of the ancient mariner. He's happy to see the hermit. He's happy because he says that he will shrieve his soul. He will make clean his soul. Make clean, purify his soul because by washing away the sin that he had committed. And that was the killing of the albatross. So the part 6 ends with the approaching of this boat. In part 7 you will see that uh, the ship in which the ancient mariner was traveling, that ship drowns and uh, the ancient mariner reaches the land uh, through the boat, through this boat that has, had come to his help. Let's see how uh, Coleridge takes us to the end of this journey. Part 7. This hermit good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea. Now Coleridge also seems to dedicate this, this part, part 7, to the hermit. He gives, he's giving importance to the hermit. He's giving importance to uh, the pure soul that he has introduced. So you can, you can understand from here that Coleridge uh, intends to give a moral lesson through his poem. He wants to um, make it sound uh, a religious and a moral duty 
of a person to uh, um, to pay the price of his sins or to uh, go through the punishment of his sins and then to redeem his soul and uh, and then pass it on to the other souls so this hermit he says good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea and so he this hermit he tells us does not live in the city he lives in the woods somewhere in the woods how loudly his sweet voice he rears and he's singing loudly but he's not singing a romantic song he's singing holy hymns he loves to talk with marine mariners that came from a far country so this particular hermit he was he since he lived in the wood next to the sea he was familiar with the sailors he was familiar with the mariners and uh, he loved to hear their stories so uh, maybe he was the, this was why he was approaching this ship also he he knew that uh, there must be a soul that needed pardoning he kneels at morn and noon and eve kneels kneels in prayers he kneels bends and so he bends before his lord at, at morning at noon and at eve he has a cushion plump so he he says that his body is plump and because he kneels most of his time there is a cushion so he's hunchbacked slightly he bends is as if he's bending low his head is bending low it is a moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump so he says so here he is using a metaphor coleridge uses a metaphor uh to show how uh, uh, you know um a piece of wood is hidden under the moss is hidden under the overgrowth overgrown grass the overgrown uh, uh weeds growing in the forest so he says just like that the his overall appearance the appearance a poor appearance of the hermit it hides the pure soul within just like the moss hides the pure oak stump within the skiff boat neared i heard them talk why this is strange i trow now that small boat it came nearer and the mariner could at, uh, could uh, could even hear them talk and what were they saying why this is strange i trow where are those lights so many and fair that signal made but now so they are also wondering they wondering because now that they have approached the ship they see no light they don't see the light he, he says those so many lights the fair lights the signal that was being made then he says we don't see the signal now and they don't see any men on the ship also strange by my faith the hermit said and they answered not our cheer and now the hermit also wonders that uh, when they saw the signal and when the boat neared the ship they must have called upon the uh, called upon them they must have cheered them they must have tried to communicate to people on the ship but he says nobody answered us the planks looked warped and see those sails how thin they are and see now they are analyzing the condition of the ship the ship of the ancient mariner and the hermit uh, understands that the ship has been through a lot because he sees the planks are shriveled shriveled up and uh, planks or the wooden boards have shriveled up and uh, he says the sails are even thin and sere as if uh, the ship is very old or it has been through a lot i never saw aught like to them unless perchance it were brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook alone he says i have never seen anything like this he is talking about the ship the condition of the ship the ship of the ancient mariner he says i have never seen anything like this before in my life unless he says like the withered leaves withered dry brown uh, leaves uh, that i see on the uh, floating on the surface of the brooks or the waters waters fresh water streams in the forest 
So he's comparing the condition of the ship to the withered, um, webbed, uh, uh, dying, uh, broken leaves floating on the surface of the fresh streams in the forest. When the ivy tod is heavy with snow and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young. He says, and he says, I see these leaves not in naturally, not in the spring season, not in the summer season when they're all green and blooming. But he says, I see them when the ivy, ivy is a kind of a, it's a kind of uh, a hedge uh, that uh, it's a kind of a weed that grows like a hedge sometimes it can even climb up uh, the barks of the trees or uh, or the walls so he says when it is heavy with snow so he sees I see those dead leaves in the winter season and everything is covered with snow and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she wolf's young so he says uh, when the wolves are hungry and they stoop down to eat the owlets, the young ones of the owl. So, or when the owlet, he says, she eats the she-wolf's young, the wolf's young one. So it's a strange thing that he says. He says, I see this, this, this the condition of the ship is so strange or the ship appears to be so strange that it looks as if something really strange and horror stricken must have happened to him. It must have been through a lot and it must have been, it must have been through uh, the def devastations of nature. So because he's comparing uh, the condition of the ship to a phenomenon which is opposite in nature, which does not naturally occur in nature. So the sh he believes that the ship has passed through uh, has something has happened to the ship which is unnatural, which is supernatural, like the owlet eating the young ones of the wolf. Dear Lord, it had a fiendish look. The pilot made reply, I am afeard. Push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The hermit is not afraid, but the pilot is afraid. He is afraid by the ship, by the look of the ship, which appears to be not of this world, but of some other world, of the supernatural world. The boat came closer to the ship, but nor I nor spake nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. The ancient mariner says, I did not move. I did not speak, and I did not move until the ship came very close to the, until the boat, sorry, the boat came very close to the, ship and the, the, at that moment he says a sound was heard right under the ancient mariner's ship under the water it rumbled on still louder and more dread it reached the ship it split the bay the ship went down like lead this was what was to happen only the ancient mariner was to survive so what happens is that there is a sound a sound starts from right under the ship, in, uh, from the depths of the ocean. It uh, uh, reaches up. Everybody can hear it. It is loud. It's getting louder and louder. And eventually, so a whirlpool is created. A vacuum is created. In, and the ship, the ancient mariner's ship, is sucked into that vacuum. And it sinks into the ocean. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound, which sky and ocean smote, like one that had been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. So the ship drowned, the ship sank into the ocean with a dreadful sound, Coleridge tells us. But he says, my body lay float, float. My, his body did not go down with the ship, it floated on the surface of the water. Like, he says, uses a simile, like someone who's, bo who's been dead who's been drowned for seven days. But swift as dreams, myself I found within the pilot's boat. So, but so from there he's taken up by the uh, boatsman. 
Upon the whirl where sank the ship, the boat spun round and round, and all was still, save that the hill was telling the sound of the sound. So, because as the boatsman approached to help uh, for his help, and when they got to that point where there was a whirlpool, where the move water was moving in a circle, and a sucking um, vacuum was created in the center in which the a ship sank, the mariner didn't sink, he stayed on the surface of the water and when the boat entered that region it also moved, spun round and round, it moved in a circle and eventually it's, everything became still, he said except that the sound reverberated through the hills. I moved my lips, the pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit. They all thought maybe that he was dead, that he, it was a dead body. And so when he spoke, he says the pilot shrieked and he fell down in a fit. So they were, sh they, were sh they were so frightened when he spoke that they thought maybe that it was a dead man talking to them. The holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit. I took the oars, the pilot's boy who now doth crazy go, laughed loud and long and all the while his eyes went to and fro. The young boy is totally frightened. He's, Coleridge tells us he doth crazy go. He went mad, he went crazy, his eyes were moving from left to right, up and down. It was as if he had gone mad, as if he could not believe. But he, it was under, because he was really frightened. So the ancient mariner says, I took the oars. So he started rowing the boat. And the young boy says, ha ha, full plain I see, the devil knows how to row. Now the young boy thinks that he's a devil, maybe by his looks, he does not appear to be some holy saint or a holy soul, but a devil. And now, all in my own country, I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat and scarcely he could stand. They're all shaking badly, but they reached the land. The boat reaches the land and the ancient mariner finally set foot on the land after a long, long, long journey on the ocean. And when they set foot on the land, the ancient mariner immediately falls down upon his legs, upon his knees, knees and hands, and he begs the hermit to uh, show mercy to him, to purify his soul, and uh, to pardon his soul. So he says, O oh, shrieve me, shrieve me, holy man. The hermit crossed his bro. Stay, say quick, Kothi, I bid thee say, what manner of man art thou? So when the ancient mariner asks him to purify him, he says, oh, shreev me, and shreev me. The hermit asks him to tell his story, to tell his story. And this is important because ancient mariner tells us, forthwith this frame of mind was wrenched with a woeful agony which forced me to begin my tale and then it left me free. He says when he began to tell his story, his, this frame of mind, he says this body of mind, this physical body of mind, it was wrenched with woeful agony, with extreme pain. It was filled with extreme pain at the memory of what had occurred, what he had been through he says, my whole body was filled with agony and pain and suffering and torture. And I told my tale, but after he said I finished it, I felt free. So uh, he, was, he felt relieved, he felt peaceful. Now these are very important lines. The ancient writer says, since then at an uncertain hour, that agony returns. The agony, the agony to tell someone the story. The agony to share that horrible experience with someone. The agony to pass on uh, God's message to the rest of the creatures. So he says that at an uncertain hour, he doesn't know, but at some point in his life, he feels the urge to tell the story again. Until my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. And he says, until I have told this story, my heart keeps burning. 
I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. To him my tale I teach. These are also significant lines because uh, the ancient mariner tells us that he does not tell his story. He does not tell his tale to every other man. He says, I move from land to land. And I am blessed with a strange power of speech. So you understand now why he was able to uh, catch hold of the wedding guest. How he was able to stop him and how he was able to uh, make him <coughs> sit through the end of the story, till the end of the story. He says, when I see someone, I know the man who will hear me. So he picks out the man. And he only tells his tale to a certain person, not to everyone. But he says, to him my tale I teach. The last line is significant here. Because he says, I teach. So implication here is a moral lesson. What loud uproar bursts from that door. Now we are back to the scene the setting of the poem, which is the wedding, the wedding that is going on, he says. Now a loud uproar bursts from that door, the door opens again, the wedding guests are there, the wedding is maybe over, the guests are coming out. But in the garden bower, the bride and the bridemaid singing are, and hark the little whisper bell which biddeth me to prayer. There are two contrasts pitched here now. First he says, when the doors open, they could see uh, the garden where the bride and the bridemaids are singing. So the beautiful scene of luxury and life and uh, uh, materialism and uh, the, uh, a sense of uh, happiness and joy without uh, any care, without any uh, worries or without any uh, unity with nature, with God, without any sense of unity with nature or God. The second image, he says, is that of a, the church bell. He says, and hark the little whisper bell which biddeth me to prayer. So the one, on one side there are the bells, there's the music of the wedding. On the other side there's a, there's a bell, there are the bells of the church which call to prayer. So Coleridge here divides the world. He was unable to divide the natural and the unnatural world, but here he divides the, uh, the materialistic world with the spiritual world. So he says on the one hand there is there's a music of the world which is tempting, which attracts us towards itself. On the other hand there is the um, there are the bells of the church which call you to prayer, which call you to uh, uh, seek union with God. O wedding guest, now the ancient matter addresses the wedding guest directly. His story is over. Now he talks to him directly. He says, This soul had been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely it was that God himself scarce seemed to be, seemed there to be. He says, I was all alone. The ancient mariner was all alone on the sea. I need not go into the detail. You know what he has been through. And he felt that I, uh, at one time, I felt that even uh, God was not with me. And he felt lost and he felt alone. And when you feel, it is through the absence of someone in your life that you feel how uh, great was their presence. So because at one point he actually felt that even God had left him, uh, he could now appreciate the presence and the help from God. So he say, so he's remembering that time and he says, when I was so alone that even God seemed to have deserted me. Oh, sweeter than a marriage feast, it is sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company. So he says, it, I am happier more when I am in the presence of God when I'm near God, when I'm in the church, to walk together to the kirk, to the church, in, a, in some goodly company, in the company of some good, uh, uh, pure souls, rather than being part of any marriage ceremony. To walk together 
to the kirk and all together pray. While each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. This great father, this father is a term mm, very commonly used in Christianity and it is a reference uh, to Jesus Christ but they also address God with this title. So he says all of us in the church we bend our heads to prayer before our Lord so, and that gives me more peace of mind, that gives me more joy than anything else in this world. And, but that, uh, he also talks of the other loving creatures like old men, babes, the loving friends, youths and maidens, all he say, they, all, obje all creatures they bend before that, before that great authority. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest, this is the message that Godrej is now giving you, through his mouthpiece, who is the ancient mariner in this poem. So the ancient mariner kind of becomes his mouthpiece and gives out, spells out his moral lesson. It is, he prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast. So he prays well who loves well. So love is at the center of everything. Loving God's creatures, loving everything uh, without any reason, loving everything only for the sake of God is at the center of everything, is at the heart of everything, is at the center of all religious philosophies. So love is important. He says anyone who is able to love all God's creatures uh, can only pray well. A prayer without a heart filled with love is meaningless. So you, you, the heart should be able to love, but then he lays down conditions. He says love man, bird and beast, all creatures. He prayeth best who loveth best, all things both great and small. So he says again, he re-emphasizes it, he says, so loving is important, whoever can love best, love most, who has more love, more compassion in his, in, in his heart, is more close to God, is a more blessed creature, but he has to be able to love everything uh, with equal passion, whether great or small. So love uh, is, is, uh, is not, um, there is justice even in that feeling. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loves all. So God, now love, he says, is an attribute of God. That is why he, he uh, is, Coleridge is placing um, love at the center of this, his religious philosophy because he says it is one of God's attributes. God also loves all his creatures, whether ugly or beautiful or small or great or good or bad or angels or devils. So he says God um, is love. So he expects his creatures also to share his, uh, his attribute and to love every, everything, every object, everyone without any discrepancy or without any discrimination. The mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, whole means grey, is gone. So one, so finally we brought to the end of the poem. The mariner who was, who, uh, was with us from the beginning of the poem is now gone out of the poem. And uh, he leaves the poem with a similar description from Coleridge the, which he was given in the beginning. Whose bright, he talks about, Coleridge talks about his bright eyes and his grey beard. He is now gone and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. But the ancient mariner has achieved, achieved his aim. He had stopped the wedding guest with a purpose in mind. He, he knew that he would be, his story would be able to have an influence on this particular wedding guest. He, maybe he had seen some goodness lur lurking in the heart of this wedding guest. That was why he had stopped him 
and uh, because he knew that this wedding guest would be able to carry forward his message and spread it on or pass it on so uh, that purpose is achieved because the wedding guest now instead of going inside the wedding and being part of the wedding which he w really wanted to do now he turns away he went like one that hath been stunned so look at the reaction the words are strong he says he went like one which who had been stunned and is of sense forlorn and is of sense forlorn so he he went he away he walked away as if he had lost his senses as if he was not in his right state of mind he was so shocked by the tale that he had heard that the wedding guest uh, was in a strange kind of a mood maybe in a in the similar kind of a mood that uh, the ancient mariner was in but the last two lines are important because Coleridge tells us this, that this wedding guest was a sadder and a wiser man he rose the morrow morn the next morning when he woke up he was a sadder but he was a wiser man so sadness is uh, here is being associated with wisdom it's not only joy and happiness uh, that uh, uh, that uh, resolves all our problems and that can uh, uh, bring us blessing Coleridge here is telling us that sadness is also linked to wisdom so uh, having the having love for all creatures of God having a sense of mercy for all creatures of God uh, having uh, uh, having some kind of um, feeling for all God, creatures of God that is linked uh, to to our love for God that is linked to our deep wisdom that is linked to the deep wisdom of the Lord himself that we are to live in harmony with nature with the whole of the natural world and we are to live in harmony and in peace uh, with all of mankind this is a message uh, that Coleridge has tried to convey to us through this poem so with this we come to the conclusion of the poem it was a long long poem but I took pain to go uh, uh, through the poem uh, line by line with you so that uh, you could uh, be able to uh, understand actually how Coleridge uh, builds up the drama, builds up suspense, how he's able to uh, link the two worlds together, how he's able to uh, diffuse tensions at times, and how he's able to lead you to a conclusion. So how the story uh, of sin that he had uh, uh, that he had begun in the beginning of the t uh, poem now uh, eventually leads to a, a redemption of the ancient mariner and all the other themes how they uh, emerge in the poem and then how they uh, are concluded by the poet himself so that was why we went line by line and uh, as we moved on I, I also looked at the deeper significance of the lines and analyzed the lines deeply with you wherever a, a different theme emerged I discussed that with you also nevertheless in the next lecture very briefly I will uh, take up the themes different themes of this poem and I will take up also uh, some of the questions that may uh, arise out of Coleridge's poems and his poetry and uh, we can look up uh, how uh, Coleridge attempts to explore these themes through his works there's different themes through his work so uh, we close the lecture today with just the analysis of the poem because an analysis of the theme will require uh, another lecture so I'm going to leave you here with uh, uh, the rhyme of the ancient mariner complete 
and we will look at the questions and as well as the themes in the next lecture and if we have time we will also begin with the next poet so i will see you in the next lecture thank you